topic that we'll be talking about today is again forces, but we will be talking about the next part. Um, this um, this presentation is basically be covering the second part of forces, which will be about the main three forces of sorry main three laws of Newton, uh, first, second, and third. And moving forward, let's see what it has. So. We're just going to dive in into the first law of Newton and then uh, I'll explain it very qualitatively. Newton's first law. Friction and air resistance can cause a car to come to rest when engine is switched off. If these forces were absent, we believe that a body once set in motion would go on moving forever with a constant speed in a straight line. If you imagine that there is the car that is moving, let's just say you are driving that car. So you see that it's going to move in or continue its motion until and unless it is stopped or it is um, decelerated by some external force. And that some external force is, is an opposing force. So we call it friction or air resistance. What if there is no air resistance or what if there is no friction? Well, if there is no air resistance and there is no friction, then that means that the car will continue to move and move and move. Well, then if, if this is the case, then it tells us something that if for a body, to, for if you want to make something stop or if you want to uh, put a car that is moving to rest, we need to apply an opposing force or otherwise it will keep on moving. Similar is the case with everything around us that, that was once, once set in motion. So that is, force is not needed to keep a body moving with uniform velocity, provided that there is no opposing forces acting on it. That once you apply some driving force to an object, it will only get to rest if there is an opposing force set to it. And if there isn't any opposing force set to it or applied to it, then there will be no disruption or no change in the motion of that body. So that is basically what it tells. This idea was proposed by Galileo and is summed up by Newton's first law. Okay, now this is the first law of motion over here and it's very important for you all to like memorize this over here. A body stays at rest or if moving, it continues to move with uniform velocity unless an external force makes it behave differently. Well, there are some things to note in this. A body stays at rest or if moving and then uniform velocity. Now, what does it exactly say? So we're, they're talking about a body that is set to rest, right? That a body that is not moving that is stationary v is equal to zero if it if v is equal to zero a is also is equal to zero obviously um i mean if it is rest for like a long time um or if moving continues to move with a uniform velocity v is equal to some value i just put x and a is equal to zero, right? So now we have one thing, and the uh, wait. The other thing to note is that external force, unless an external force acts on it. So if there is no external force, then we know that F is equal to zero, right? So basically. Uh, Newton's first law says that a body will not change its motion or will uh, not change its motion if it's moving with the uniform velocity uh, until and unless it is acted upon by an external force. And it is the same concept that we were talking about if a body is already moving in constant velocity and there is no um, opposing force acted upon it. 
So a body stays at rest or if moving it continues to move with uniform velocity unless an external force makes it behave differently. I've written these things because they are going to make sense in the next law of Newton that um, acceleration is zero over here, acceleration is zero over here too, and f is equal to zero over here too. Well, now we're going to again discuss this. It seems that the question we should ask about a moving object is not what keeps it moving, but what changes or stops its motion. This is again a very um, uh, is is a very important concept that once a driving force is acting upon it, the driving the part of the driving force is done. Like let's just say there was this car. Okay. And um, it's a toy car, and I just pushed it from here, right? I just like pushed it from here. I gave it a push. Initially, it might have accelerated for some time, but for after some time, it reaches a constant velocity. And if there was no opposing force because of the rigidity or because of the weird surface of the of the ground where it is um, where it is set to move or um, let's just say if there is you know, no other opposing factors the sky is going to move in uniform velocity for like till eternity but it doesn't it comes to stop after some point because what changes or stop its motion comes its place that there is a force that can change or stop its motion. How? What if? What if there was um, no friction, but there was this person who was sitting over here, and he just blew some air, or like you know, uh, turned on a fan from this side, so the car now moves in this direction. So the point is that the change in motion, the change or the stop in motion will only occur if there is an external force provided to something. Or otherwise, um, if there is no friction, if there was no external force that changed, it, that changed or that stopped objects from moving, then, there, then uh, things would have been moving till now. Uh, things that were set to move in uh, millions of years ago or like hundreds of years ago they would have been moving even now but they don't because friction comes in play or other forces come in play so the smaller the external forces opposing a small moving body the smaller is the force needed to keep it moving with a uniform velocity um, again that is simple that if there is less uh, opposing force or there is less retaliation from the other, from one side so then that means that uh, that um, lesser force would be needed to keep it moving, like less driving force would be needed to keep it moving. Yeah, okay, now this is a depiction of Newton's first law of motion. Um, I was talking about a toy car, you can talk about this uh, ball. This, this object, which is a football, is at rest. It is sitting on the ground. Unless this footballer comes and kicks it with an unbalanced force. By an unbalanced force, I mean that the, the force, that the resultant force is not equal to zero, that there is an external total outcome of the resultant force. So it is an unbalanced force, that there is a resultant magnitude. And an object in motion will continue with the constant speed and direction. Well, now this ball is moving and moving and moving and moving. Uh, the the footballer kicked it and then it just kept moving and moving and moving unless and until it hit this goal over here which is shown over here and now this goal is uh, giving it that breaking force or just causing it to stop so 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 this is the external opposing force and this is the driving force in both of the cases a force was needed to set a body into motion or to make it stop so this is one thing to note. Now we're we'll going to be talk about uh, um, some concepts of mass and inertia because they are going to help us uh, in the further topics. Now Newton's first law is another way of saying that all matter has a built-in opposition to be to being moved, or if it is at rest, if it is moving, if it is moving. To having its motion changed. Its property is called inertia. 
So the the thing is that an object does not want to change its motion or does not want to be set in motion. So that that's basically the point of it that the that there is a property of mass that there is a property of all matter that it it gets rigid or gets stubborn when you ask it or when you try to move it or when you uh, wanted to change direction or when you wanted to stop in other ways that if you want some matter or some object to stop its motion or to change how it is behaving or moving specifically it will have to require some external force being applied to it and this property that that the mass opposes change in motion is called inertia and we have studied that before that mass is a measure of inertia that the bigger the mass bigger the inertia bigger the force required to move it now we'll be talking about newton's second law and it is very very important to be very clear about newton's second law um Newton's second law of motion pertains to the behavior of objects for which all existing forces are not balanced. The second law states the second law basically states that the acceleration of an object is dependent upon two variables the net force acting upon the object and the mass of the object. The acceleration of an object depends directly upon the net force acting upon the object and inversely upon the mass of an object. A force acting upon an object is increased, the acceleration of the object is increased. As the mass of an object is increased, the acceleration of an object is decreased. Sorry. Okay, now let's talk about this. Um, motion pertains to the behavior of object for which all existing forces are not balanced. Okay, now this says that we are going to be talking about Newton's uh, second law only when the resultant force let's just say we're just calling it no let's just call it um r let's just say we're calling it r this is a force when r which is a resultant force is not equal to zero that in order to talk about second law of motion we need some unbalanced external force that there is some um unbalanced force right so unbalanced force okay so there is some unbalanced force now um second law basically states that the acceleration of an object is dependent about upon two variables now let's write these variables number one is acceleration which we are talking about and then it is dependent on f which is the net force and it is also dependent on the mass right now let's just without going into the detail of what basically uh, Newton's second law is let's just talk about one thing um, acceleration what do you think will happen if you apply more force to an object if I push something harder is it going to accelerate even more or is it going to uh, not accelerate that much well obviously it is going to accelerate more so I can say that acceleration is directly proportional to force that the greater the force the greater the acceleration or the greater the acceleration that means that the greater force is being applied to it so that is the directly proportional sign now what happens if an object if, if you keep the force same, let's just say you are applying 10 newtons of force on an object on two balls. One of the balls is of 5 kilograms and the other ball is of 10 kilograms. What do you think which ball will um, accelerate faster? Well, obviously the lightweight ball, the 5 kg ball will accelerate faster because we have already studied the concept of, concept of inertia that the object, the tendency of an object to change its motion is more and it's better when the mass is less so um, that means that basically acceleration is directly uh, sorry inversely proportional to mass now I can if I put this in an equation I can simply write a is equal to some constant which is a f and 
a is equal to some new constant uh, let's just say l divided by m right okay now if you um now basically if you look at them you can simply see that this k over here is basically um, 1 by m and this l over is, is f so that basically means that f is equal to m a or that a is equal to f divided by m so as the force acting on an object is increased that distance is increased the acceleration of an object is going to be increased that if the force is increased acceleration is going to be increased definitely as the mass of an object is increased let's just say mass is increased then the acceleration is going to be decreased it's going to have the opposite of, uh, effect so this is basically the second law of motion that the acceleration of an object depends directly upon the net force keep in mind that if the net force is zero then we do not need there is no need for application of um there is no need for application of uh, newton's second law because newton's second law is only applicable if we're talking about unbalanced forces so um so if 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 an object is being applied to some external force then definitely um then definitely there is going to be some um acceleration and that acceleration will be directly proportional to that force and if you increase that force acceleration is obviously going to increase and if you increase that force it's going to now another concept is that mass of an object if you are not you know adding something in it the mass of an object is a constant value it does not change in any location or any other things so so you can also use mass as just a constant uh, and you know uh, neglect its its uh, relationship with the acceleration or force when you're talking about it because there are very less ways in which or very less scenarios in which you're changing mass to observe the change in force or, or the change in acceleration but most of the times we are observing the change of force or acceleration that are dependent on each other okay now this is basically the uh, second law of motion that is commonly stated that the acceleration of an object has been used by net force net force again which means that there is an external force, force is directly proportional to the magnitude of net force that the acceleration is directly proportional to the magnitude of net force. Another thing to note is that, yes, exactly, I'm just going about that, that they are going to be in the same direction. Let's see, in this uh, law or in this um, formula, F is equal to MA, if I go, if I, I just say write that, um, F is equal to MA. This is a scalar quantity, this is a vector quantity, and this is again a vector quantity. So the acceleration of an object as produced by a net force is directly proportional to the magnitude of the net force. Well, now we know that if I increase force, I increase acceleration. What about the direction? Well, that's also pretty simple because mass does not have any direction mass is just a magnitude mass is just a number so obviously the direction in which we apply our force will be the direction of acceleration of the body if there is this body um, if there is this body that I am applying force to would I just say in this direction then obviously it is going to accelerate or increase in speeds in, in, in that very direction Okay, the next part of it says that and it is inversely proportional to the mass of an object. That obviously if an object is very small, uh, I mean, I shouldn't say small, I should say if it is very lightweight, um, then obviously um, it will 
uh, accelerate less it will not accelerate uh, so it will accelerate more than the object that was uh, heavier so there's that the verbal statement can be uh, expressed in an equation form as follows the above equation is often rearranged to a more familiar form as shown below the net force is equated to the product of mass times the acceleration so f is equal to m a f net uh, that is implied because obviously we are going to take the final magnitude of the force okay um this is again uh, the same the these are some examples that force is being applied to it of the mass um, um wait let me see it look over here so the force being applied on both of these objects is same right the, this this force has remained same the, the the length of this arrow is same so that means that the magnitude of the force is same and so is the direction but over here the 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 basketball is obviously uh, has far less lesser mass than the than the than this huge jeep so that is why because of the lesser mass its acceleration is so much greater it has a very long arrow longer magnitude and over here however the acceleration it is accelerating both of them are accelerating in the same direction because the force is in the same direction but the jeep is not accelerating as much as the ball is doing because of the obviously mass difference that the mass of jeep is so much more than that of basketball so it requires uh, it, the acceleration that is produced is not as much as it was for the basketball Now this is the Newton's third law. It is a very important law again, and Newton's third law basically uh, says that if a body A exerts a force on body B, then a body B exerts an equal but opposite force on body A. Now it's a very um, overused, or it's been talked about um, the the this law. People talk about it a lot that every action has an equal no, equal and opposite reaction, but there are so many things that are to be noted when you are talking about that. The Newton law, third law of motion basically says that the forces never occur singly, but always in pairs a result of action between two bodies. Again, that action and reaction forces. For example, when you step forward on the rest of your foot, pushed backwards on earth, the earth exerts an equal and opposite force to forward you. Now, these all things are very easier to say, but it's very important to actually understand them. Now, if, if let's just talk about this. Um, I'm sorry. Wait. Okay. Oh my God. Okay. So if this is a table, right? And um, there is this book that is in place. The book is applying some some force on the table. Okay, so book B is applying some force on the table T. Now the third law says that there is an equal but opposite force on body A from body B too. So that means that the T is also applying the same amount of force on body B. Now this does not, this is not equal to, um, th this does not mean that the object is um, stationary because of that. The, the thing that we're talking about is that that if B applies a force on T, T also applies the same force on B. So that's basically what I'm saying. That and and look, so the table is applying this force on this book, right? Okay. Now two things to note is that three things to note. I'm sorry that these forces are in opposite direction. Number two, that they are being applied on two different objects because if they were being applied to 
one single object and there they will always cancel out each other and and then there will be no result in force okay and third thing is that they are in same magnitude now over here it might get uh, quite in this table and book example it might get very tricky because uh, the book is not moving and the book is stationary so like maybe because they cancel out each other and that is why the book is stationary however if you look over here this is a, b a balloon and as for like first initially it had a clip on it right it had this um wait it had this clip over here attached to it okay so there is oh my god So there was this just, just imagine that there is a there is this clip over here which is keeping the air taut inside the balloon right when it took this clip apart obviously the air rushed outside and applied this force on the on whatever um i just say surface was over here or even in on the air right so the air rushes down it applies this force that is uh, marked downwards and the reaction is that the balloon goes up that 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 the this air it applies a reaction force on the balloon the a balloon applied this force on the air and then the air applied this reaction force on the balloon now the reaction is pretty visible on the balloon but it is not as visible on the air because it is a very big vast object or a uh, medium whatever so so the point is that they don't have to cancel out each other but they act on different two bodies they act in opposite direction and they have same magnitude so um, i'm going to read that again for example when you step forwards from the rest of your foot push backwards on earth and the earth exerts an equal and opposite force forward on you two bodies and two forces are involved okay we know that one on which one of them will be the action force and the other one would be the action force the small force you exert in the large mass of an earth gives no noticeable acceleration to the earth but the equal force it exerts on you very much smaller mass causes you to accelerate see and now if a runner is set to run it is pushing to the ground and it is applying some force to the earth but when it recoils back the, the force that the earth applies it same as the one he was applying to the earth but the man runs or it does apply some force to him and causes him to accelerate but there is no significant um, like acceleration on earth because earth is a very very huge huge body so that is one thing that i was uh, trying to also convey in this balloon example that the air is a very huge medium so the effect on air is not that uh, visible or is negligible but the reaction that had on balloon was very uh, noticeable and it did rise up so note that the pair of equal and opposite forces do not act on the same body if they did there could never be any resultant forces and acceleration would never be possible so this is also an example that i just showed you that for your book resting on a table the book exerts a downward force on um, the table and the table exerts an equal and opposite upward force on the book this pair of forces act on different objects and are represented by red arrows if you look closely you can see that the 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 you know all 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 of these this is like a gravitational force pair and then this is a contact force pair push of table on the book and then push of book on the table both of them are of the same magnitude but are in this different direction and then pull of earth on the book pull of earth pull of book on earth so that's about it okay now the next topic that we'll be talking about uh Okay, so next topic that we are we'll going to be talking about is basically terminal velocity and it is a very very important topic um i've been talking about giving uh, some hints about it when we were talking about free fall and also when we were talking about uh, air resistance but now we're going to get into it um, really uh, detailed in detail so air resistance so we are going to be talking about terminal velocity when an object falls in the air the air resistance 
the fluid friction that is that if an object is fluid, uh, falling in a fluid and air is also a fluid because it's a gas and fluids include gases and liquids the air resistance opposing its motion increases as the speed rises so reducing its acceleration now the thing is that um, as an object is falling through the air initially we know that the one force that is being exerted on it is just and just um, and is simply it's what do you call it the weight the weight or the gravitational acceleration so 9.8 meters per second square is its initial uh, is its initial acceleration so as I told you earlier that the air resistance has this property that it, it tends to catch up with the driving force or with the with with the basic force that is causing something to accelerate so the air resistance opposing its motion increases as the speed rises so reducing its acceleration so okay eventually the air resistance acting upwards equals the weight of an object acting downwards so when the weight which is the driving force becomes equal to the air resistance that was acting uh, upwards they both become equal then the resultant force becomes zero and uh, so basically the gravitational force which is the weight it balances the frictional force which is the result uh, air resistance so now our resultant force is zero and we know that an object was moving so if its resultant force is zero so that it will be moving in constant velocity and that constant velocity is called terminal velocity whose values depend on the size shape of weight of an object a small dense object such as a steel ball bearing has a high terminal velocity and falls a considerable distance with a constant acceleration of 9.8 meters per second square before air resistance equals the weight however if you are talking about a raindrop or an object with a large surface area such as a parachute it has a lower terminal velocity and only accelerates over a comparatively short distance before air resistance equals its weight a skydiver has a terminal velocity of more than 50 meters per second before the parachute is open uh, objects falling in liquids behave similarly to those falling in air because we are talking about fluid friction that is air resistance okay now this is a very important um, graphical represent uh, sorry uh, you know picture representation of what basically happens so um, this skydiver is at this point the skydiver is not moving so there is no res uh, ex uh, air resistance okay no it is set to release initially it just set is set to release it's not moving okay now it is accelerating as the skydiver begins to fall velocity increases because of the downward force of weight this is W so the air resistance also increases now this is air resistance and it's very small in the start so it the, the diver is comparatively still um, you know um, accelerating okay now what happens is that um, eventually the skydiver reaches the speed at which air resistance equals terminal velocity now this air resistance increased 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 until an analysis became equal to this red arrow so um, now w is equal to the air resistance let's just we call it f so w is equal to f parachute opens when the parachute opens the air resistance increases so it is bigger than the downward force so the so the skydiver decelerates now as the parachute increases now the thing is that the parachute has a lot of surface area like it's something like this in real life so there is more area for air resistance to be applied to so obviously the air resistance increases and now instead of accelerating as it was accelerating in the start now it's doing the opposite thing it's basically decelerating so the skydiver decelerates so the air resistance decreases until it is same as the weight so the skydiver stops decelerating and reaches a so slower terminal velocity as he arrived just in time to blow out the candle of his birthday cake well that's something that they're saying that this happened okay now we're talking about this parachute is jumping from an airplane initially over this point it is accelerating at 9.8 meters per second square and 
initially it's straight but then it goes into this plateau like shape we know that the air resistance is catching up and now oh no it just became equal to the uh, to the what do you call it um to the air terminal velocity, the first terminal velocity when but the parachute was not open and the air resistance has that just caught up with the um, the air resistance has just caught up with the weight force. Now at this point, the parachutist opens his parachute and then there is this sudden increase in area, so sudden uh, increase in air resistance which causes the object to decelerate for a very small amount of time, but it does decelerate. So this is the deceleration part. This over here is the deceleration part. And then after the parachute also is you know in the steady place, then the um, air resistance decreases and then it becomes again equal to the weight and um, then it reaches second terminal velocity which is this steady speed and then in the end he just reaches the ground at over here. So now the important thing to note is that there are two terminal velocities. Number one is this when the parachute was not open and the weight was equal to the force and the other one is when the parachute was open and this happens after the deceleration because of the parachute being opened. So two terminal velocities when in a, uh, we're talking about this parachutist um, scenario. That's about it um, for now.